Thank you very much for your welcome. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, today as we focus on world mission, the work of the gospel around the world. And this morning I'm really asking you a question. To what extent are you involved in that mission? We sing about it, but to what extent are we involved? Because there are many ways to be involved in uh, those who are taking the gospel uh, to the nations. Uh, to, at the end of my first year in ministry, I went to the Lausanne Conference in 1974. Uh, one of our lecturers, our professors in college, put my name forward and I was invited to go. They were encouraging younger ministers to get involved. And I met with two and a half thousand people from lots of different countries. Uh, and we thought for 10 days about the task of taking the gospel to the world. Uh, the theme was let the earth hear his voice. And uh, we were thinking about the complexity of that. It was in Switzerland. And so uh, they had a clock which was counting how many more people were born into the world while we were talking about it. And I can't remember the exact number, but it was a lot. And you saw the sort of the finishing line was moving all the time as the world grows. And uh, it just gave me a sense of the, the task we are called to do, to take the gospel to the world, to take the gospel to the nations. And it's something which is spoken of in the book of Genesis when God calls Abraham. And uh, as is emphasized in the psalm, uh, which we heard at the beginning of our service that James read, that when God blesses us, then that blessing has an overflow to other people. I will bless you, God says to Abraham, and through you all nations on earth will be blessed. And uh, Trevor was talking about how small the work is. You know, when I went to visit our, two of our missionaries working in Mongolia, in outer Mongolia, uh, I, they, they drove, they, they picked me up at the airport at Ulaanbaatar and uh, we drove for about eight hours over Mongolian roads, which are different from ours. Here and there they had tarmac, courtesy of the uh, Chinese. And uh, the other places it was just mud, really, quite firm mud, it wasn't too bad, but quite remote. And we passed uh, little places where there were gears, round houses made of wood and cloth that wrapped round it. And uh, you'd see these people living in literally the middle of nowhere. And uh, they had a few animals. Usually they were near a water source. And uh, I thought, you know, Abraham was a bit like that. He was just one man uh, with a lot of animals. Uh, and uh, yet he knew God. And God was going to use him as the, the beginning of taking the gospel to the nations. In fact, on my way to Mongolia, I flew via Moscow, just stopped overnight, uh, to, I'd rather to change planes. And I sat next to a Mongolian lady, young lady, on the plane from London to, uh, to Moscow. And we were talking. Her father was a diplomat in uh, London. And uh, I'd been reading up about Mongolia and what people believed. And so I said to her, are, are you a Buddhist? And she said, oh, no, she said, I'm not a Buddhist, nor are my parents, she said, but my grandparents were Buddhists. And uh, so I said to her, well, what are young people in Mongolia believing today? And she just simply said this, they're believing in Jesus. That was a non-Christian's comment. In 1990, there were four known Christians in Mongolia, four. Uh, today, there are in excess of 40,000. It's difficult to know exactly how many have come to faith. And it's been a spontaneous work of God that he has done. And of course, when you have a young church, young in faith and actually young in years, there are lots of challenges. And uh, the couple, Mark and Jill, who worked until recently in Mongolia for about 30 years, their task was, uh, was to encourage those young Christians and teach them and establish them in the faith. And, and also during their time there, they were involved in encouraging Mongolian Christians going on world mission. You see, young Christians who have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their savior are enthused about telling others the good news. And uh, so they went to inner Mongolia, they went into China. And uh, they can get into China more easily than Western missionaries can. And they had a great passion to, to share the gospel. 
but no background, no history of mission sending, how to do that. And there were lots of challenges those new missionaries faced. Um, but they, uh, they were, they'd been blessed by God, and they just this passion to tell, they wanted to get involved in taking the gospel outside their own immediate situation. I wonder if that's part of your DNA. I think my time in Lausanne kept in my mind this sense that, that our task, the task of the kingdom, is take the gospel to the nations, Wales included, uh, but also play a small part, just a small part, in God's work around the world. Uh, I also paid a visit a number of times to uh, what is now called Papua. Uh, it was called Irian Jaya, and uh, it's not Papua New Guinea, it's the other side of the island. And, and there again, there's been just a remarkable growth in the church. The, the gospel was taken by missionaries to Papua around 1960, perhaps a little bit before, so not that long ago. And uh, Papua is a, a nation that has a population roughly the same size of Wales, about three million, um, but very complex. Um, they speak 270 different languages. You can imagine what their road signs look like. <laughs> except they don't have many roads. In, in fact, Wamana, one of the chief uh, cities of the highlands, is uh, the biggest city in the world, totally supplied by air. There are no roads that go into it. And uh, so these missionaries from Australia, from uh, Holland, from Britain, from America, uh, had to learn like, no language schools, no writing down of the language, no understanding of the structure of uh, these languages. And uh, also the people lived in remote places, in hills and valleys, so you had to walk in. It would take two or three days to walk into places that were really quite close to Wamana, the center. Uh, nowadays, you can go in by MAF, and that's how we, I was there in 2014 for the dedication of a complete Bible translation in the Hoopla language. One of our missionaries was involved in that. Well, it took 12 minutes by MAF <laughs> to get that distance at two or three years. And just imagine you arrive in a village for people who've had hardly any contact with outsiders. And you arrive and you try to communicate with them. Uh, one of the old elderly Dutch missionaries talks about how he was so determined to tell the people the gospel that he, he said to them, they were spiritists, they were animists in their religion. And he said in English, or in Dutch, God is good. You are bad. God wants to make you good. Well, he wondered, did they understand that? Until one day a man came to him and said, I am bad. I want to be good. And uh, now out of the, well, it was two and a half million, let's say three million, Half that population profess to be Christian. Just imagine that. Just imagine in Wales if since 1960 we had seen a million and a half people professing to be Christian. You know, some, some people might say, well, are they genuine Christians? Well, they profess Jesus Christ. And they again, and my reason for mentioning them is because there's amazing growth. I think it's one of the most blessed situations in the 20th century. But also they've got a missionary vision. A man called Otto Kobach, who I traveled with a number of times. He came to visit this country too and stayed with us. One of the Bible translators of the Yali Bible, another complete Bible in those languages. Only about four or five complete Bibles yet in those 270 languages. Very intelligent man, the son of a medicine man. His father had, couldn't read, but he heard the stories from the missionaries. And then he told his children, uh, you know, an oral tradition is very interesting. People remember what they hear and they pass it on very accurately. And uh, that's how Otto became a Christian as well as his father. But uh, when the tsunami happened, uh, it affected many places, including a place in Indonesia called Aceh. And uh, it's one of those countries which forbids anyone who is Christian to come in and preach the gospel. And these people... Uh, who most of them were living in the hills, but they obviously had links in the bigger towns and cities too. They said, this is our opportunity 
to tell them about Jesus. And they, they sent practical help uh, to people whose communities be decimated by the tsunami uh, with love from Jesus. But again, it's this passion, this thing that is in the DNA of people who are Christians. They want others to know. And uh, one of the things we might recognize is that that, that passion is something that can wane. And, and we think about world mission, but we're not actually involved. And this morning, I want us to think about what it means to be involved in mission, because we can be, and uh, it can make a difference to us, to the church, and uh, to the world around us. Because the work of mission is predominantly the work of churches, not of missions. Missions work with churches, but it's in churches that people come to catch a vision for world mission and then seek means to fulfill that and engage with mission agencies who may be able to help them and facilitate that. And it's a question of having as a local church a both and mindset. Jesus told his disciples the Holy Spirit was coming, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes and, he, and you will be witnesses both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And uh, it's that both and, because we can become so preoccupied with the local situation that we don't see that wider work. And in the passages uh, which James read earlier, I asked them to be read because what's clear is the actions of those who were leading the churches. Because they understood the task of taking the gospel to the world, to their Roman world as it was for them. And uh, church leaders have a vital role in that. They, they become our role models, and they also encourage and facilitate uh, the outreach of churches. So, for instance, in, in Jerusalem, uh, we read about how there were Christians who, without external authority, uh, just started telling the good news of Jesus to Greeks, not just to Jews. And the Lord blessed that. And a church in Antioch came into being. And it just simply said the Lord's hand was with them. And a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. And then when the, the church of Jerusalem heard about that, Antioch was a Gentile center, very different background, very different people, very different ways of life from the Jewish church in Jerusalem. But they decided to send someone. Uh, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And uh, he was a good choice. Uh, his name means son of encouragement. And he was that. And uh, he, when he saw the grace of God, the evidence of that grace, he was glad. And he encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man. Isn't that a lovely description? Uh, he was a good man a man with a true heart and a love for the Lord and faith. And uh, so the church in Jerusalem sent a man, they sent a leader to help this new church. And then because the work was so great, Barnabas took the initiative of bringing Saul of Tarsus, who was to play such a vital task, uh, role in the ongoing work. And, and he brings him in. He'd been converted some years ago. He's been in the wilderness in a sense, but now he comes into the center of Gentile Christianity. And uh, so, again, that those actions of the leaders, the church in Jerusalem sends a man. Barnabas brings another man. And then we read in Acts 13 how this church at Antioch, it really becomes the bridgehead for taking the gospel to the Gentile world. It's a relatively new church itself. And it's benefited from the teaching and preaching of uh, Barnabas and Saul, and uh, they have a number of leaders, and, well, they were worshipping the Lord and fasting. And then the Holy Spirit says, set apart for me uh, Saul and Barnabas for the work to which I have called them. And they realized this was God telling them to set apart their two best men and uh, to begin a work, a work for which there's no great master plan. Uh, but which they are called by God to undertake. And, and again, it's the leaders there who take that role. Or later on in Acts 16, we find the elders of the church at Lystra, one of the 
newly founded churches through Paul and Barnabas' first missionary journey. And uh, when they're revisited, uh, then uh, this time by Saul and uh, Silas, there's a young man named Timothy living there. And uh, the brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. He was a good man, they said. And Paul said, I'd love to take him along on the journey. But again, you see the commendation of the leaders. I do wonder whether they ever commended a young man again because they lost him. Uh, you know, we tend to keep our best young men. <laughs> they said, we won't commend anybody. We'll keep it secret because that's so he'll come and take them. Um, but again, it was the rule. They, they wanted to play a part. So one of the newly established churches wanted to play a part in the next chapter in that uh, advance of the gospel. Uh, or again, in Philippi, very interesting church. We'll look at that a bit this, after, this evening. Uh, when Paul was in prison in Rome, they, they sent a man called Epaphroditus to find him. I don't know how he found him. You know, he, he, didn't, he didn't have uh, Google Maps to find him in, uh, in Rome, but he found him. And he'd come there just to help him. And when Paul is sending him back and Epaphroditus has been ill, nearly died, he says that he thinks it's necessary to send him back. And he says, he's my brother, my fellow worker and fellow soldier who is your messenger whom you sent to take care of my needs. Again, they sent a man uh, to encourage the Apostle Paul at a particularly difficult time in his life. And by the time you get to Acts 20, where you have a description uh, of Paul's team, you find that we're told he was accompanied by Sopater, son of Pyrrhus from Berea, Aristarchus and Secundus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derbe, Timothy also, and Tychicus and Trophimus from the province of Asia. And so different churches are mentioned. That's how the task of world mission is fulfilled. Not by any one church, the church in Jerusalem or the church in Antioch, but men, women from churches, and they're focusing on the task of taking the gospel to the world. They're involved. The churches are involved. And uh, I wonder how we are encouraging involvement in mission by people of all ages uh, in uh, the church. Uh, people who we value, but we're ready to encourage to get involved in some way, short or long term, in the task of gospel. And especially to encourage and inculcate that in our younger people. I don't just mean teenagers, but younger people. Uh, that actually they think in terms of world mission, taking the gospel to the nations. Let the earth uh, hear his voice. So, so we see something there of the role, role of leaders at both and. And it's important for us to be proactive in doing that in the life of the local church with a positive view uh, to encouraging people to engage in various ways. Let me just mention one or two ways. Well, about half a dozen really. <laughs> More than that, 12 I think it is. Um, ways you can get involved. Have you ever thought about it? Actually beginning to engage in some way. So when you get your holiday brochure out, you, you get the mission magazine out and read and say, where can we go? Summer teams that go to different countries. Uh, an elder and his wife retired uh, from the church in Deeside where we are, got involved in a summer team to Moldova. Uh, a role perhaps you've heard Maureen Wise speak about her work there and they went been the Sylvia third year they've been just a share in that work young people taking gap years out and saying well perhaps I could spend that gap year overseas we've had young people going to help missionaries for instance who are educating their own children and uh, the young people have gone to help in that task help the family with that medical electives a year out and uh, going to spend that year in another country and uh, to get experience of medicine there. Or language electives. A young lady from a church in Cairo went, went to Spain on her language elective. And uh, she uh, linked up with a local church while she was there and got to know the work of the gospel in Spain. Or perhaps you're somebody who, you're not a great speaker, but you've got practical project skills. And uh, there are teams that go out and help with building projects, to provide extra facilities for a church, for a ministry, for a Bible college. 
and uh, to get involved there. Or well, recently, two ladies from our church in St. Melons <laughs> went to visit one of, one of our missionaries, Becca Jones, who's a doctor in Uganda, and they went to visit her and to spend time with her. They come back full of information and understanding uh, about how hot it is, how dusty it is, uh, and the nature of the work in a, a large hospital there with so many needs. And it, it's informed them uh, about what's involved. Some people get involved in pastoral training projects. Pastors go to help train pastors who don't have access to training courses. And people do short-term service. We had a young man who was a pharmacist with Boots, and he uh, Boots provided for a, a career break of up to five years, uh, when you could then come back to the same level of post you had um, and have five years to do something else. And uh, I wasn't quite sure we could help him, but then suddenly a letter arrived from Tanzania saying, we need a pharmacist in the Doma. And uh, he went out and he spent several years there as a, as a pharmacist and has kept that mission vision ever since. Tent making ministry, perhaps with your job you go abroad to different places. Do you think, how can I use this for the purposes of the gospel? Make contact with Christians there and, and long-term service. Or perhaps you're a, a geek, um, you know, you're, you're into technical things uh, and you're good on digital technology. We've got a team of geeks. That's what they call themselves. They're not being rude <laughs> when, I, when I say that. They, their little videos have pointed heads and uh, they spend time developing programs uh, which are put onto uh, small mini uh, chips which can be put in phones and uh, they develop those um, and uh, they, they send them to countries uh, where it's not possible to go as a missionary or to provide for, um, materials and, and things and, and Ben and Liz Griffin who some of you will know they're involved with that team 100 fold and you can do that work from home and take a a role in that thing. There are just so many ways to get involved and, and to engage and to begin to know a particular countries, to know the nature of the challenge. And uh, some of you have done these things, I know, and uh, you know how valuable that is. So that when we're praying, our, our prayer is informed and understanding. And uh, that we're seeking particularly, as I said earlier, to motivate and equip younger people and to empower them in the task of taking the gospel to the world. Perhaps we don't realize that young people have always played a, a vital part in the work of God's kingdom. You may remember that Jeremiah complained when he was called to be a prophet, I'm only a child, but that didn't let him off. He was to be a prophet, he was to speak the word of the Lord. John the Baptist was about the same age as our Lord himself, a young man, and he died as a young man. Jesus only lived to the age of 33, and his disciples were young men whom he called to get involved in the task. Uh, the Apostle John lived to the 90s AD, it seems, but uh, most of them died along the way. Paul, Timothy, Titus, they were young men when they first engaged in the gospel. The reformers were young men when they began to stand up for the gospel. Now, those we call the Methodist fathers were actually young men when they first began to take the gospel uh, to uh, the British Isles. William Wilberforce, involved in slavery, he was a young man when he began to campaign. Pioneer missionaries like David Brainerd and Henry Martin and Jim Elliot, young men. And uh, the... Uh, Preachers like Spurgeon preaching in his teens and Lloyd-Jones, still a relatively young man. That's how God has used younger people. When I was in Malpas Road, we appointed a group of men to, to lead and women to lead the Sunday school. And uh, people say, it's great to have these young, people, young men involved, young people involved. And one man said, well, I'm very encouraged to be called a young person because I'm over 40. But you see, that was an insight into how we think as churches. We don't tend to think that people who are in their 20s and 30s can make a difference. But historically, they have been greatly used by God. If you're a younger person, don't think you've got to get gray hair and grow a beard before you're able to serve the Lord in taking the gospel to the nations. In fact, in Acts chapter 2, we're told it's a characteristic of the age of the Holy Spirit uh, where uh, the prophet... Joel said in the last days, 
God said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. And your old men will dream dreams. And I often think it's easy to fall asleep in the afternoon, isn't it? <laughs> and have some dreams. But it's the young people that I think. And yeah, just how encouraging an older person can be in getting alongside and getting involved oneself too. Um, not by any means dismissing that. Because that's one of our great tasks. In Operation Will, one of the editions of it, uh, it says the church in general has lost the younger generation in Western Europe and those lands formerly under communism. We, we, we've, there's a gap amongst the younger and It's a desperate need. It goes on to say young people are a challenge. In few countries has Christianity any meaning for young people. Christians are considered remnants of a past age that hinder progress. New age spirituality, Eastern religious worldviews, a fascination with the occult, secularism have diverted millions from their Christian heritage. In uh, Central and Eastern Europe, huge amount of unemployment amongst young people. Drug and alcohol abuse, suicide, the great needs to reach that younger generation is the challenge for us here, isn't it? In Wales, in Bregen, to reach that younger generation. And very often it will be those who are of that generation who will be effective in bringing the gospel to them and seeking to engage them. One of the problems of the fact that many of us live uh, to a greater age, age than our uh, fathers and grandfathers and mothers and so on, uh, and having relatively good health, is that we can somehow fail to realize the importance of every successive generation being involved and uh, getting uh, particularly involved with a younger generation because there is a, a spirit of pessimism, perhaps even despair in the world today. Um, you think of young people uh, and uh, the challenges they face, what careers are they to follow. Uh, sometimes the younger generation is called the debt generation. Uh, those of us who are older have gone through a time where we've been able to establish uh, some stability materially, but it's very difficult for a young person who starts with a, a debt because of their university uh, course, uh, or they then have to get married, they buy a house, and, and the future is so uncertain. And uh, for those who uh, get overwhelmed by the situation, suicide seems to make sense. Let's step off, let's leave the world. And uh, postmodernism is, is, has had an effect. Um, so that people don't believe that there is a a story, a big story, which explains the world from, for us from Genesis uh, through to the second coming of the Lord Jesus and the new creation. And uh, that there is no answer to life, there is no meaning to life. And so people say to us when we say we believe in the Lord Jesus, they say, well, it's wonderful for you. Uh, I'm glad you've got one, but I don't believe that there's such a thing, that there's any coherence to life as it is. It's, it's meaningless. We've been going through Ecclesiastes in the the church in St. Melons, and uh, the, the preacher there keeps on saying, meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless, and, and that's the feeling for many. Uh, and a time of election seems to magnify that. And so people listen to all the stories. I read a book which said, in the modern jungle, there are three rules. Trust no one, suspect everyone, take nothing at face value. And above all, reject anyone who claims to bring you the truth and uh, that's the challenge facing us to, to reach these people with the gospel and to tell them of what a difference the Lord Jesus makes because people matter they are precious precious in God's sight it needs to be precious to us relationships matter how many non-Christian friends do we have real friends and uh, people feel alone. And also a younger generation says, can the world be changed? Will it just go from bad to worse as it seems? Or is there, is there some message of hope? And the only message of hope in the whole world is the good news of Jesus Christ. And people need to hear that. And uh, we need to be engaged, involved, perhaps in particular countries maybe upon our hearts, so countries you know of or you've heard of or you've read of, you're acquainted with, how can you be involved in the work of the gospel there? Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, 
a man got in touch with us and his wife. They were working in Central Asia and they had a, a burden to take the gospel to Afghan people in Afghanistan. And uh, so we accepted them and we were planning that way and then the changes took place in Kabul. But it's still in their mind, it's still in their heart. They're still seeking ways uh, to take the gospel to Afghanistan despite all the obstacles that are there and praying to that end the Lord will open a door for them. And of course, if you go to Afghanistan, you have to have some other reason for being there, not just a missionary. And the husband is, is a trainer of wrestlers. Uh, and so he's learned a particular form of wrestling, comes from Brazil, and he's going to teach Afghan men how to wrestle. I can well imagine when you've got somebody in a really good grip, you can say, now there's something I want to tell you. <laughs> You may wonder why I've been so friendly to you, but before I break your arm, I want you to know. <laughs> but again, getting in close quarters. But the thing is, even though the door seems to have closed, it's still on their heart. And they want to take the gospel to those people, and the Lord may yet open a door for them, even into that situation. And, uh, well, young people want to change the world, uh, but it becomes a a better place. Are you involved? Are you involved as individuals? Are you involved uh, as uh, a church? Is that your vision? Is it, is it a, a major focus in your prayer meetings, uh, in your leaders' meetings, your agendas, in your church meetings? Local work, yes, pastoral care, all those things are important, but also taking the gospel to the nations. What role do we play in that, whatever that role might be? Uh, William Carey is the, called the father of modern missions, and uh, he's a, a great example because he believed in the sovereignty of God, but he also believed in the use of means, that it doesn't just happen. God is sovereign, therefore we go forward with confidence as we seek to do things, he will bless them and use them. You may know what he said, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. It ultimately comes down to our confidence in God. And uh, in the book that he wrote, uh, presenting the challenge of taking the gospel to the world, he listed the main impediments that he saw uh, of taking the gospel to those he called the heathen. First was their distance from us. Second was their barbarous and savage way of life. Third, the danger of being killed by them. Fourth, the difficulty of procuring the necessities of life. And fifthly, the unintelligibility of their language. That was where things were at at the end of the 18th century. But you think of today. Distance from us, a matter of hours on a plane. Uh, their barbarous and savage way of life, not in the sense that they are threatening us as they, for instance, threaten men like John G. Payton uh, when he took the, the gospel there to Tarnak. Uh, being killed, well, that sometimes happens, but not often. Um, financial support, material, that, that can be done. Language, well, languages can be learned. There are means of doing that. You know, as many of the obstacles which Carey saw are different today. They're not as great as they were then. But, of course, the great impediment is the spiritual impediment. Um, we were reminded again in the children's story of the hardness of people's hearts, including our own that were hard. And uh, secularism uh, and other faiths that are strong and where the gospel is forbidden, but the Lord is able to overcome it. And you know, Kerry, because he believed and had great confidence in God, that lifted his spirits. If you've read anything about Kerry's experience, he faced all kinds of challenges in India. <laughs> And this is what he writes, and with this I'm going to close, because I think it, it focuses, focuses us on the right place when we think about getting involved in some way in the world mission task. He says, when I first left England, my hopes of the conversion of the heathen were very strong. But among so many obstacles, it would utterly die away unless upheld by God. I have no earthly things to depend on. Well, I have God, and his word is sure, 
And though the superstitions of the heathen were a million times more deeply rooted, and the examples of the Europeans a million times worse than they are, if I was deserted by all and persecuted by all, yet my hope, fixed on that sure word, will rise superior of all obstructions and triumph over all trials. God's cause will triumph, and I shall come out of all trials as gold purified in the fire. That's faith in God. By faith, we say. <laughs> that was Carey's faith. God's cause will triumph. And if that is true, and it is, what a privilege to be able to play a role, however small, in that great task of taking the gospel to the nations. Let the earth hear his voice. Amen.